All right, hitting it now. So hello everyone and welcome back to Elevating Beyond with a two word mission statement, change lives. And we're getting ready for an awesome show today. First of all, I have sitting with me, Glenn Withrow. And I'll explain to you in a minute, his wife, his lovely wife, Hallie Todd, is going to be jumping on as well. We connected. I, we're always honored to have hundreds of you submitting for guest inquiries. But something about, I think it was your, your PR, oh, I forget her name. She was, she was a lovely lady who reached out about the trailer of the movie that you guys have coming out, The Last Champion. And my assistant, it just got missed in the cracks and I happened to catch it like late, late one night and watch the trailer. And I'm like, whoa, like that, that movie looks awesome. Um, and I, I personally reached out and was like, hey, let's see about getting them on because I really liked what it stood for. And, and just so everyone knows just real quickly, and we'll be talking about this during the interview, but the last champion as, as we're recording this, it actually premieres tomorrow, December 8th on iTunes, available to purchase. And I have Glenn with me who co-produced it with his wife and his daughter, Haley Todd and Ivy Withrow. His wife also stars in the movie along with, and I'm probably gonna butcher your last name, sorry, Cole. Is it Cole Hauser? Hauser, Hauser. Cole Hauser. I knew it, I knew it. Cole Hauser. Yeah. And Hallie. Hallie like that. I said that perfectly. And, and, and I know there's a whole other, like, from watching the movie that you guys sent to me, the early release, and I'm going to save that for the interview, um, a lot, so many other amazing actors throughout it all. I'm not going through the whole list, but there were so many, such great talent. So first and foremost, Glenn, welcome. How are you doing, my good man? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me, Mark. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So Glenn, um, from us talking a little bit last week, it was, it was really interesting just kind of hearing your whole, some of your whole backstory of how from like 20 plus years, you've been doing this, starting out with acting and then drop or didn't drop out, but stop acting, went into film school in your thirties and I just think it's kind of cool to sort of share that story behind the story, maybe starting with when you were in a movie. And I love how you just threw that out there. You're like, oh, by the way, I was in um, The Outsiders. If you've ever heard of that movie. And I looked up who you were as one of the greasers. I was going to have yeah. a picture of it to try to show it on screen. But there was a lot of clips with you in that. What, what was the character's name again in The Outsiders? Tim Shepard. Tim Shepard. That's right. Tim Shepard was sort of the outsider to The Outsiders. Yeah, wonderful part. Once a greaser, always a greaser. Greasers forever. I love it. From going from there, Glenn, and acting in movies and having that, like, I don't know if that was what I was asking you this before, if that was your main dream at that time, like, I, I want to make it as an actor. Like, what was that like to where you sort of pivoted and transitioned in your 30s to, I'm going to go back to film school, I'm maybe going to lay off acting and, um, start really getting into the directing producing and, and writing and now you're freaking you and your whole family are doing all of it yeah well that was because of uh, how francis influenced me francis always worked with his family and you know i got to work with him four or five times and i saw how he worked with his family and that they were all involved and all inclusive and i said you know one day that's what i want to do so, but, I, you know, starting off as an actor is sort of your easiest way in. It's not really easy, but it, a lot of people start off and then they move into writing and so on and so forth. And it was like that for me. I, um, I had worked a lot uh, younger. I loved it, but it was just never satisfying enough. So I started writing. And when I started doing that, my first script was optioned by Disney. And I said, okay, well, you know, maybe we've, you know, I got something here we can keep pushing forward. And then by the time I hit my late thirties, I said, I don't know if I want to just be the paint anymore. I think I want to be the painter mm. and throw all the colors up there and, 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 and leave that type of work behind. So it was um, a lot of hard work. Uh, went back to school, 
film school because uh, I'd already worked with Francis. So I was, and being an actor, I was already very comfortable working with actors. Um, but I wanted to know the technical side of it. And I come from a, a background in photography, so I understood lenses, but I still wanted to see how you really put all of it together from storyboarding and the whole process. And just just real quick, back. Glenn, so Francis, to everyone listening, can you just, for a lot of people that don't know, can you just explain who Francis was so everyone? Yeah, Francis Coppola, uh, you know, the master, the godfather, Apocalypse Now. I think I've heard of those movies. But I only have to say those two, we all know. Right. Uh, just a, an incredible person to work with, an incredible person to study. So that, yeah, that was the big motivation behind it. You know, I really said, I'm going to copy this guy. He's one of the best. And uh, Francis always said, you know, take from the best, but make it your own. Mm. And uh, it's kind of what we did with The Last Champion, <laughs> actually. Um, but he was a great influence. And what I did with, with Hallie is we, we ran a studio that we had for years in Burbank. It was a sort of an insert stage and um, photography. I would rent it out and we'd re rent it out for casting sessions. And uh, we was able to keep, that's what helped really stay away from it. Now, my wife, I was fortunate. She was doing, she's done five series. She, she was able to, that's why I was really able to afford <laughs> stepping back to be honest with you and pursue that uh, that's pursue cool this. and well i know we'll be having howie jump on here in a couple minutes yeah. like the the lizzie mcguire series on disney channel and that ran how many years did that run for i don't know how many years because they did them back to back to back mm. may have done She'll answer that 100 episodes. I don't know. Okay. Um, I know that they're getting ready. They're in talks right now to do to revamp it and do it again. When you went into it, so was the first full movie that you actually wrote, produced, and directed, The Mooring, which you did with your daughter, um, Ivy? And if I read that correctly, was she only in 10th grade or was she a sophomore in college? 10th grade, high school. Wow it revolved around girls that were like similar in age, but um, we had a, we had to kill nine girls in that movie. <laughs> I saw the trailer for it, <laughs> <laughs> but we had to keep it. Uh, you know, we, I didn't want it gratuitous. I didn't want just blood and guts everywhere because I'm dealing with, with girls that were, you know, underage and an audience. So we try to make it as creative as we could without that. You'd sort of indicate the violence or the death. And I think that's scarier anyway. Right, right. It, it, it is. It, it brings in a different level of kind of like that suspense and, and the wondering. And yeah, I, I could tell even just by the trailer how it was shot. It looked like it was shot kind of differently. Um, and I'm going to be checking it out for sure. But I thought that was so cool that she was only a sophomore in high school and already co-writing yeah. this first film with you. And so... It's what, what would, family business. Yeah, I love, no, I love it. I love it. And that's where, when I have your wife jump on in a minute, I'm going to ask both of you some more things about the good and the bad and times we probably want to choke each other. Exactly. <laughs> but um, from, from doing the first movie, like what would you say some of the biggest kind of takeaways as a whole were, at least in my experience from having different businesses and stuff is, kind of experience is the best teacher and, and you really kind of learn more and more by doing it. You have to go through terrible on the way to becoming great. And I'm not saying that it was terrible, but what would you say some of the things were that you really learned that when you guys sat down and did the last champion, you're like, Oh, we're going to do this like kind of ahead of time differently. Well, uh, I, I learned that I never want to shoot at night on the water in a houseboat. I don't want to do that. Uh, I think what we learned was perseverance mm. for Good word. this film. I think also uh, I learned that, which we're applying this time, is that we wanted more control of the product and the end product and not have it turned over to someone else and let them make the decisions on marketing and 
to really get the type of story we wanted out there and not, you know, what a studio or what another production company would want. That's what we took away and said, we can do this ourselves. Let's raise the money. Let's raise the marketing money and let's, uh, let's get it out there ourselves. Let's cut out a lot of the middle guys. That's right. So the, the first one or the morning you and, and your daughter Ivy co-wrote together and you directed that was taken on by another film company as to where the last champion it's hundred percent you guys literally from the ground up. Right. Right. Yeah. And it's really rewarding this way. And, you know, and Hallie, Hallie was, you know, the other writer on that on, on the mooring. And we just found out also oh, wow. it okay. was that we could, you know, we could work together and argue through problems and said, if we're going to do this, if we're going to really do this and be the auteur, then let's do it. Let's do it with the last champion. And uh, everybody rallied around us with that. And it just, things are happening in a very wonderful way now. It, and if, if Hallie's ready, is she, can she jump on right next to you? Cause I have some, I, I want to wait till she's here from watching. Yep. Uh, hey, Hallie. Hello, how are you, Mark? This is Hallie, Hallie, Mark. Nice to meet you. I'm, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I have to say, um, we've been honored to have so many different guests over the years, whether it's been Olympic athletes or NFL players, New York Times bestselling authors, just all kinds of awesome people. And my um, super awesome administrative assistant was really excited about you. She's like, I guess she grew up watching the Lizzie McGuire show and now she's in her, her late twenties, but um, she's like, oh my gosh, the, the 13 year old me's mind would be blown right now. If <laughs> I thought that was great. I had to tell you that. I say hi. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so Hallie, you co-wrote this, obviously, and produced it with your husband and daughter and also starred in the movie. And I had a chance to watch the screening of it that you guys sent to me last week. And I had planned to watch it in two parts because I have so many things going on. I'm like, all right, I'll do one half this night. <laughs> I, I stayed up till 2 a.m. watching it. I'm not just saying it, it was it was really good. Like it, it hit all had me tearing up. It had me like pumping my fist in moments. It, it was really good. It, it was awesome. So I'm glad yeah. I watched it in one sitting because I feel like that the ending is it's I think it's better in one sitting this movie. Right. I, I couldn't, yeah, I couldn't stop watching it. I'm like, I have to keep seeing what happens. But so <laughs> when you're writing it, did you already have your role in mind as you were writing that? That was something I was curious about when I was watching the movie. Yeah. So when we were figuring out the story and who was going to be part of the community and in that, you know, city of Garfield, who the players were going to be, so to speak, uh, we knew that um, Michael Miller would have a mother that was um, going to be like his prime obstacle um, separating himself, him from like his dreams and goals. And we kind of knew I basically what she was, how she was going to function to the story. And, and we decided that I would play that part. And then as we wrote it, we knew that that was going to be the character I played. Okay. I didn't have to uh, compete against anybody. <laughs> for the part. Well, and just everyone listening and, and when everyone's going to be watching this too, um, is sorry, am I saying you? Is it Hallie or Haley? It's Hallie, you, like Sally. Like Hallie, Hallie. Okay, I'm oh, the Hallie. king of butchering. If I ever have a guest on and say their name correctly, then people will be like, "What's going on, Mark?" I'm so used to having my name mispronounced that it's like I just correct people now. <laughs> I didn't when I was younger, but now I can. For everyone watching and listening to you, you were playing the lead character. Well, one of the lead character, I guess he would be the lead wrestler um, and his mom and uh, like struggling with alcoholism and a lot of other different things going on there when you were kind of glazing over like the hardships in, in his life. So, yeah. And I, I was looking at that because at first when it came on too, I was looking at an old picture from when you were the mom on Lizzie McGuire. And I was like, wait, which one? I'm like, whoa. So yeah, you, you did great. Like I didn't even recognize you in it at first. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you.
I'm not a film critic. I'm just speaking for, yeah, it was awesome. So, so with, I recognize that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sorry. No. <laughs> I'm uh, okay, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I, I have something that I have to. So, I talked to, oh, Paul, it was Paul Bradley who um, oh, reached out. It. He was also, he has worked with Dan Gable and mentioned being um, a, a lot of working on the set and the wrestling and stuff. And something he told me that was really cool um, about Cole was, and, and actually all of you, was how important it was to all of you that he said you would be asking after the different shots, like, was that wrestling move legit? Like, did it really you know, how do you feel about that? And he thought, he, he just wanted me to personally tell you the fact that all of you cared enough about it and weren't just trying to make it, eh, that doesn't matter as long as we got the shot right and the special effects. And Cole would be like, did I do that move the way that it seems real? And he thought he really appreciated that. Yeah, that was really important. That was like, because I was a wrestler. So it was really important that and you're and we're doing it in front of Dan Gable. So it was really <laughs> important that we got every bit of it right and to keep it authentic. And so I had a lot of eyes on it. We'd go back and say, okay, we good, we feel good about that. And I mean, they rehearsed it for, you know, almost a couple months, all the moves, but and with Paul and Joel Shear, who really kind of choreographed everything. Okay. So that definitely very important we got that right. And Dan, by the way is getting the Presidential Medal of Freedom today. Oh, no way. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Congratulations, Dan. Yeah. And, and he has a spot. He um, has a part where he's one of the announcers, right? In the yeah. He I call, plays himself. Yeah. I, um, I, Joel Shear gave me his number. And, you know, he'd spoken to Dan and said, yeah. Dan said, let him, you know, he can reach out to me. So you got to remember, he's like my idol. Yeah. My hero in high school. So now I've got his number and I'm calling him and I basically just, I, you know, I had to close him. <laughs> I had to close it and go, please be in this film. So, but he's tough. Dan is like, really, he's the real deal. So he read the script, read it a couple of times, handed it off to his wife to do it. And he goes, yeah, I'll do it. I'll, uh, you know, I'll be in it. So when I got him, That's awesome. then we got Randy Lewis, another Olympian. And then we got Jason mm -hmm. Bryant, who's the Olympic announcer. So oh, it yeah. all came together in such a beautiful way and gave so much credibility to this film and to this sport, which I don't think for me has ever been shot the way that I wanted it to be shot and shown. It was great. And, and also there, there's something else that, <laughs> that Paul told me to ask you, and I'm definitely not mentioning any, any names, wouldn't even know the name, but he said um, how you guys went and reshot one of the scenes, and I'm not going to give any spoiler alerts, but one of the bigger wrestling scenes towards the end of the movie. And at one point there was a smaller audience and then you guys redid it with a much bigger audience. And he said, one of the, one of the extras was pr like pretty belligerent. You guys actually had to toss them off there. Are we allowed to mention that? <laughs> uh, I know what he's talking about. He's probably talking, well, we had to, we reshot the ending. Yeah. Uh, of, of the film and uh, because it wasn't uh, a lot of things were going on it had a massive snowstorm we could we lost our crowd coming uh, and it was never really covered the way I wanted to cover it because of time restraints so uh, and then at the end I think he's talking about this girl who jumped out of the stands and she was like the first one there almost in Cole's arms and oh, it's oh, like in Washington yeah no yeah well, so we go okay we can't have that so <laughs> But when we went back, we, we shot it a year later in Texas and we were able to really do it right. We had seven cameras, plus we had a, you know, a, an overview camera. So I, I'm sure that's what he's talking about. Yeah, <laughs> he, he was cracking up about it. So I don't know. That's but yeah, that that must be it. <laughs> so with um, the three of you doing a movie together, both of you and your daughter, you were mentioning before how you've kind of, and your second one that you all wrote together. How do you work out some of those biggest, I'm just really curious, like when you are arguing over something, like how, who, who's, who's more of the, 
dominating personality in the family. I wonder what Ivy would be saying. I listen. I listen. He, he does listen, and um, and sometimes we'll we'll be batting around ideas, and uh, and he he's very instinctual. So um, a lot of time he'll make a decision in that moment whether uh, he likes it or doesn't like it. But a lot of time he'll say um, no, and then I have to kind of like, oh yeah, but it's a really good idea. So. I have to like, or Ivy will, you know, go, yeah, but think about, think about blah, 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 blah. And, and then, you know, all of a sudden he'll go, you know what, I, you're right. So we just have to break through the, sometimes the, that instinctive reaction. But, um, but I think one of the hardest things, but it's also, I mean, I love a good puzzle. Like I love the editing process because it's really a puzzle. How do you, mm -hmm. how do you make this as dynamic as possible? And I love the puzzle of writing challenges how do we how do we get this person to get to this reaction and have it be an organic path to get there and not just a really artificial sort of forced um, moment and so I, I just love that process I think that's my, my favorite part of the whole thing and in the room there's a puzzle in just trying to get everybody to to give everybody else their voice and um, we all yeah. get very passionate. So we're all like, no, 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 that's bad. No, he's got to do this or she's got to do that or whatever. But we, we work it out. I mean, we have a, the, the best time and we laugh our butts off and, and we can't wait to do it again. So that's the funny. arguments, it's more like just family stuff. You know what I mean? You wouldn't, right. you wouldn't have those arguments working with just a straight partner, writing partner. It's, it's because all the family stuff is, you know, feeding into the boat. Right. <laughs> so That's it's true. like it's like normal family dynamic plus the creative process. So it's just uh, super intense. But I mean, but it's also it's also just really special. And people go, God, that's amazing. You do this together. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it, it really it's, is it's cool. Yeah, I have to kind of remember that this is not a normal thing. Families don't do this and we do it. And and it's really Glenn driving I mean, he's pushing that boulder up the mountain. Like he's he's carrying more burden as a director, obviously, but even as the uh, the chief producer, he's he definitely is like on a another level of uh, participation insanity. and insanity, insanity than I am. <laughs> right, on. the whole my business, input yeah. is more creative and not logistical or not like business, you know. Right. Okay. Did you ever write? Were you always all together when you wrote, or would you be? Like your daughter, I think, was in law school for some of it. Would it be like you do this part while you're here, or were you always together? And, uh, we go we go in and out of those stages. We'll we'll say, can you take this? I'll take this, or Hallie will write, or Ivy will write. Then I'll look at it. Then I'll give notes, and eventually, you know, it makes it to the final pa uh, page. Yeah, like we'll take our individual efforts and then put them together and kind of tear them down and rebuild them. You know, sometimes something would not get changed, but we always, I mean, I can't look at the movie and think, oh, I wrote that, he wrote that, she wrote that. I, I can't because it's, it was such a collaborative effort by the time it was finished, mm -hmm. except for any of the wrestling stuff and, and the fight scene. I think I, I don't even know how to write that kind of stuff, you know. And, but I do try to take credit for as much as I can <laughs> <laughs> on the right. Every, every line and stuff that gets quoted and. That oh, actually, yeah, we argue about that. I go, I wrote that. No, I wrote that. No, one. no you, didn't. you did yeah. not write that. I, wrote that. I love it. I remember when I wrote yeah, that. Yeah, I remember when I wrote it. So I'm yeah. think you're wrong, but yeah. Then Ivy's like, no, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> well, she's not here today. So, <laughs> so, so take full credit. <laughs> there was one scene in the in the church. And again, I don't want to give anything away, but I really liked like how it was written and i just remember there was one part he was kind of talking about forgiveness and the pastor was after he had the discussion with him he's like people really tend to overcomplicate this whole thing much more than it needs to be he's like you just you confessed it and you give it to god and and you can move on but it was just like a simple truth that even kind of hit me. I was like, yeah, I guess we do kind of like, we really do overcomplicate that. <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> now who wrote that? <laughs> you mean when he says, when, when God forgives, period, that line, you're saying, right. I mean, it, 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 take, it says it all. 
you know, just, right? Yeah, and he's saying that that um, when the pastor says people make this so complicated. Right. I think one of the things that was important to all of us was that, because um, this this movie is about a lot of things and the 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 surrendering and 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 giving it to god is is a definite part of the movie but it's not the whole movie sure. and we wanted that aspect of it to we wanted to give that message to people who may be resistant to that message mm. does that make sense absolutely so, and and the path of somebody walking through that process i don't see it very often in a movie where i believe it and where i feel like it it's it's not just so wham bam thank you ma'am so perfect you know like i right. i leave that scene not knowing if john really gets it you know what i mean he's got something's happened to him right it's, it's like a process like, oh i'm saved or oh that was you know that was a perfect bow on that package i like that it's that it's still a process that still may be working on him that's so well said i mean that's really how it works in real life too because there are other films where it can just over, I guess like over deliver too much on like, hallelujah, I've seen the light. And the next day it's like all butterflies and roses and sunshine. And right. it's yeah, like, right. no, you're still in the middle of a, a my own personal story from being in trouble and a lot of stuff in my younger years and even in jail at age 17 for me, it was a process. Um, and I talked about, I was like, it was a long, like, it's a lifelong really trans transformation, but that whatever people believe, but like the giving it to God part and kind of like letting it go is, is such a good ongoing lesson to th that scene. Just again, like kicked me in the butt, like, dude, Mark, like you can give that to God and, and, you know, let that weight go off of you that so many people right now are, are weighed down by so much, you know, oh, yeah. going on with That's COVID. Like, there's so much diversity and so much people just hating each other because of the political landscape. And then you've got COVID and I think there's a lot of despair and, you know, businesses closing, there's real stuff going on. And, and I think this film can really help if it can take people out of their discomfort or they're in their pain for a couple hours, if they can watch it, they go, okay, well, there's hope out there. There's, you know what I mean? So right. I'm really happy about that. Created something that for the times right now is something that could, could work. So that's really exciting. I was thinking when, when we were, when we were putting it together, I mean, we were talking about how it would be remarkable if this simple message could resonate with people who um, who are really needing it, but who don't like to be presented with it. Do you mean like where people kind of don't want something forced down their, like- Yeah, I know when someone's forcing something on me, I I, I don't lean in, I pull back, you know? It's like, it, it, it doesn't matter if it's somebody going, oh, you're gonna love this movie. I'm like, yeah, uh, I will be the judge of it. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I like to take my time yeah. and 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 it's, it's so personal, but, having that wish that a lot of people would get that message of hope and feeling like that could happen. But then all of a sudden this movie just happens to be landing at a time when people need it so badly and right. so much division and that there is such a message of community and, and forgiveness and, and love and hope that I'm hoping that, that people can feel a healing from it. Not, not, I mean, beyond two hours in a movie theater. In a very authentic a way. In, in a room. In, in a, a really authentic way. That's a great word I would personally use to describe that movie is authentic. And I have so many things going on all the time with my family. We have five kids. I have a whole other company for individuals with developmental disabilities. So I, I don't have a lot of time to even know who's what and what's going on where. So I was like research, like you mentioned coal on Yellowstone and I'm like, yeah. And I, I honestly didn't even have a clue what that was. And I did some research and I was checking some of those out over the weekend. Now I'm actually hooked on that whole series. It's oh, really, really well, man. It's so, but I, then I was thinking of him as like the lead in this movie and how well that character, it, like that authenticity that you were mentioning 
and how he just brings that in just in such like, I don't know how to describe it. He, his presence is like, it's subtle, but it's like, you Gary can just Cooper. feel, yeah. He goes deep. And right. It's effortless with Cole. He's phenomenal. And I, he's just I, very present, man. He's like right there in the moment. It was wonderful to, to get him. And uh, when he came in and we had a meeting scheduled to meet each other, he was interested. And um, so he wanted to sort of suss me out. And I didn't know a lot about Cole when he came in. But within five minutes, I go, this guy is John Wright, because I didn't know who was going to play John Wright. We had mm-hmm. this idea, but it was five minutes in. It was like, oh, this is the guy. This is John Wright. And once that came together, everything else started coming together. You couldn't nail any of the other characters unless you had him because you didn't want to go too old with the boys. That they had to, There had to be enough of a differentiator. You couldn't cast Frank, the coach, because... You know, I mean, everybody had to be believable in their generation. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, he couldn't look like he was related to the kids in case there was a result. You know, you just couldn't put anything together until he was set. So it was a huge relief having him and being able to put all the other pieces of the pie together. Everyone did great. I mean, the the kids that were in it, I thought did a mate for, I mean, I, I was just stuck. I was caught in the movie I wasn't even thinking about when I was watching it I wasn't thinking oh we're getting I'm getting ready to have all of you on my show next week was just in the moment in the movie which is a good thing yeah the young man that played he would have played your son in the movie Sean Scully thank you Paul told me he worked really really hard also be on the wrestling and, and it like and everyone else, but he said he really got into it and he said he, re, he respected that. He had the least amount of a wrestling background. Yeah, of well, any of but them. Casey, Casey Moss, the, the, the antagonist, you know, his foe and Michael Madden, the guy who, you know, sort of crosses over. They all worked incredibly hard. That's what he said. They wanted it. They wanted to make it authentic. And Joey, too. Joey. Luffy. Joey, yeah. Uh, they really wanted to, to get it right. It was all, it was important to them. So I was happy with that. And they were excited. We saw a lot of guys for those roles. So a lot of, a guys. lot of really fine actors, but mm-hmm. it came down to them and they were, they were pretty, uh, I think pressured to be good because they knew Dan Gable was going to be in the movie too. <laughs> yeah, no, for real. I mean, when I was talking with Paul and stuff about Dan, he was like, we, yeah, you don't mess around with that guy. He's, he's the real <laughs> deal. <laughs> But you don't, man. He's like the real deal. I mean, he's getting the Medal of Freedom. He's an incredible human being. And there's a there's a story, and I actually related it to, to back to Dan that we were on we were shooting this one particular scene, the one where they're coming out of the locker room. And if you remember, walking up onto the final match. I really wanted this, it was a long shot. It starts in the locker room, goes all the way to the match, uh, up to the the, uh, the wrestling mats. The guy operating the camera just wasn't. We just it just wasn't happening. We did 16 takes, okay, to get it the right way. And I think Dan actually liked that because it's like because he's one of those guys mm. work 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 right. So I I was excited. I said Dan because he's in the shot and he didn't get to see the shot. And I brought him over and I said what do you think? And he goes, well, he goes, it's an A. He goes, but you want an A plus, right? And I, <laughs> I went, love it. What? <laughs> I, and we did it again. I did it again. I went and said, yeah, I do. And uh, that was like, I've never, you know, it would have been a fantasy to have Ken Gable as a coach. And I was always envious of everybody. You know, these guys that were coached by him. And that was my moment to say I was coached by Gable, you know, you want That's an A cool. plus, and I go, yeah, let's get, let's make it an A plus. You know what I, I love, like always the story behind the story, and it's 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 cool to see how you like. It's just life is amazing in itself. Like I always say, God is orchestrating, and you never know how the dots are going to connect later on. But like you said, in your earlier years, where you you wanted to probably do wrestling even at another level, I believe you were competing even for state. And you only could have dreamed of having someone like Dan for a coach. And it's really cool that all these years later, 
I mean, you know, that if someone would have told you as that kid, well, well, don't worry. Like if the wrestling thing doesn't work out later on, you and your wife and daughter will all be making a movie together and he's going to be in it (laughs) and coaching and helping give you notes. Yeah, that was pretty spectacular. I, uh, yeah, that would have been a whole other trajectory had he been the coach, but you're right. I got this moment with him. Yeah, that was pretty special. I'm, I'm glad I, I sort of own that story now and can uh, share it with people because that's the type of guy he is. He is like, yeah, it's an A, but you want an A plus and he works. That's who he is. That's what he's exhibited his whole life as working to that perfection. You know, Munich games, everything. I mean, that's that was Dan. And then the coaching. And the coaching, 15, you know, titles as an NCAA coach. I, he's the most winningest, you know, coach. Football, basketball, anything. He's like the, the guy. Yeah. So for me to also support and bring him into the light and uh, again, to help him, you know, to remind people, hey, this is who this guy was. And we're all here and we're all doing these role, these moves based on Gable. He's the one, you know, there's actual moves the gable lock and and it's um so it was wonderful speaking of the a plus part so how did it work for you as being the actress is it are you am i supposed to say actor actress i don't know the other way okay Uh, but um from acting in the film and then also having your husband directing were there moments there where you were like hey that's not an a plus and we're like we're not at home and i can't cuss you out right now in front of everyone but oh. <laughs> well you have to answer that it's pretty easy i mean i let all actors just bring what they their gifts to the the table and i say before i just photograph them and if something's getting a little skewed a certain way i'll try to bring them back to the overall vision of okay. how i'm seeing it you've got everybody with their vision of the of the uh how they see themselves in the film. So with Hallie, it's easy. I don't really, I, I actually really don't direct her in, unless it's something like maybe a little bit more energy or bring it down a little bit here. Other than that, I totally believe in her choices and what she does. And yeah, easy. It's easy. That's cool. And I wasn't saying that there, it wasn't A plus moments there. Just, just so you make sure that, you know, I'm saying that I just meant from him being involved as then you now acting and how he would kind of, if there was different type of tension there with that course oh. correcting or changing or how you guys worked in unity. But it sounds like you did. Sorry. I'm sorry. He would not back off of getting what he wanted from any of us, whether I'm his wife or, or uh, somebody he just met, you know what I mean? He's, he, he wants what he wants and he, uh, but he's really good because he was an actor for a lot of years and he right. he likes actors to have their process. So he's very generous that way on the set where um, unless there's something that's really just not going well, but it's, it's all in the casting too, casting the right people for the parts. And that decision early on makes his job easier. I think that was learned also with, uh, <clears throat> with Francis Coppola. One particular little story was during the filming of The Outsiders, it was the, the big fight scene, you know, with the rain and everything. And we were doing yeah. it for, I think, for five days in the rain every night. But Francis would let you improvise, come up with stuff. And I told him, I said, okay, so Tim Shepard's this guy that, you know, is joining up that, you know, these guys really respect him. He's, you know, kind of a badass. I said, um, what about when I'm like fighting, I go down and I like bite this guy's ear and bite, you know, take a chunk out, you know? And he goes, yeah. So they got makeup and they put this little piece on this guy and, Whoa. you know, my close up, I'm banging his head and I reach down and nobody sees it, but he let me do it. That's great. Yeah. So you, you that's where you, Mike Tyson uh, got inspired back in the day. <laughs> you allow the actors to do, bring whatever you can, because you never know what you're going to be able to use. And, um, but Francis really had, he had, you had so much leeway with Francis. He, and when you're exposed to that over a period of time, uh, years, seeing him, his process of working, you know, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to do what he does. He's like the master. 
I love it. I love it. So another question I had from doing this from the ground up, as far as fully producing it now, the whole investor part, I'm sure that added, I guess, adventures would be a word to say it. But I mean, I know it, it's probably really stressful. And, and kind of how do you go? I'm just and I'm personally curious from doing different businesses, but never the movie business. How do you kind of go about looking for investors and stuff in a film? You know, there's a lot of legal work, and that's why it really helps now that our daughter is a lawyer. You know, <laughs> that, that was all part of our master plan. Right. I think uh, I saw that on Yellowstone, though. Just yeah, that paid off. <laughs> yeah, right. There you go. So, um, <laughs> uh, I think the, uh, the pro- you know what? The process is like everything else for me anyway in my life. It's always been hard. You always have, with wrestling, you have to persevere. You've got to, you know, go for that A plus. And it's the same way with investors. I mean, once you get all your legal work and, you know, everybody's going to be a partner in the film, in the film, you know, company that you've set up, you just have to knock on a lot of doors and get a lot of no's. That's what I tell Ivy in life. You, you grab as many right. no's as you can. And I, I heard that somewhere and I go, that's so true, man. You have to be turned down so many times. So when you get that yes, you really appreciate it. And with that, you want to make sure that you really take care of your investors. You know, that right. it's very important that we get their money back and with their percentages. That's more important to me almost than anything right now, because if you don't have that, you're not going to, they're not going to want to get in, you know, jump in, you know, in another project with you, but you don't want to leave that on the table because there's so many stories out there that, People don't make their money and they don't do that and they don't get their money back and they lost money. But when we set out to write this, we set out to write where we could hit this niche market, this niche market and this niche market and and create something that we go, okay, we have something now that could be commercial and it could resonate with a lot of people and subsequently get our money back for our, our investors. So that's that process. You just... You follow every single lead. I followed every single lead. And that led me to person that led me to a person. But don't you think that like at one point, we really felt like this movie was being taken care of. Once the door started opening, they just opened, opened, opened. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? It yeah. was, it was kind of, absolutely kind of like uh, humbling. But it's, yeah. it's still arduous. It's still arduous to yeah. go out there and ask somebody to, you know, it's hard getting somebody to reach in their pocket for a buck. You know, hey, can you lend me a dollar to, I really don't have it. And right. <laughs> so, uh, and, and to ask for it too. Yeah. To be on the end of, hey, will you invest in this and take a risk? And yeah. But it always comes down to relationships. And I think if they, if they believe in you, then they're willing to take a chance to say, yeah, you know, it's as interesting to me. Let's, let's try this. And then they remind me, if this doesn't work, <laughs> <laughs> no, but our investors are wonderful. They're gonna they're gonna have Cole come back and he's gonna do he's gonna take you to the train station or whatever. So I've been watching Yellowstone too much. People listen like, what is he talking about? <laughs> take you to that cliff, right? <laughs> yeah. I maybe you ever gotten that part. It's like the Godfather of the West. It is really good. And Cosmers, <laughs> Kevin Cosmers, yeah. wonderful. That whole cast is. He yeah. looks the same. I'm like, he looks the same from Field of Dreams. Kevin Costner. Yeah, he looks just a wonderful film. I love him in that character too. Something that I want to ask both of you and, and with talking about, um, if there's time and you can each maybe share something, but does your whole family, like, are you, you believe in God? Were you all like raised like that? Or did you come to something like that later on? Or I believe in God and I do it, you know, I say my prayers every night. But I don't, I don't judge if somebody is or isn't. I also, you know, studied TM for a while and uh, I've always explored it. I don't, I don't make a big deal of it. For me personally, I, you know, you, you have to have something, uh, something out there that's, you, you got to talk to somebody. I agree. Allie doesn't want to hear it all the time. So where, where do you guys differ on that? Oh, I think it just is our upbringing. Like I was raised with nothing like no like my parents definitely wanted me to find it on my own like they didn't they didn't force any anything the golden rule was what was taught in my right. home. 
And so um, I came to my own thing later, I think, like after my daughter was born, just sort of uh, searching and, and uh, I keep it kind of personal. I'm comfortable telling the story, if that tells you anything. And I think that having to come to it without having it be forced on me right. was um, something I, I'm, some, I'm grateful for that. I feel like it has more, it resonates more now. It, it feels like I'm not reciting something or, or, you know what I mean? A hundred percent. Yeah. Right now with everything that's going on and I'm, I'm the same way. I mean, I believe in God. I'm a Christian, but I speak and stuff all over. I don't preach down people's throats. And just like, here's what I went through and here, like, uh, I mean, my wife, is from Sierra Leone, West Africa, originally was raised Muslim, could do a whole other show on that. But how we've come together in so many different ways, like organically through that. And I just know, personally, and something that I love about the last champion too, is when you're in these huge struggles, and life just like punches you in the face, because adversity comes is, of course, you both know, no matter what, at different times, without having like, for me, like God to be able to, to talk to and just like cry to and stuff. That's what makes me, I don't know what people that don't have something like that. So it's not to me in a way of like wanting to preach. It's more like, I, I just wish they had something because I know what it was like to not have that. And then I know what it's like to be able to have that kind of weight lifted off of you. Yeah. And I think that's in, in, uh, kind of echoing what Hallie said. It's also personal. And it was very important for us that we don't, you know, I'm not going to preach to anybody. You know, I know what works for me and I know what helps me <clears> sort <throat> of calm myself, but we definitely didn't want that in, in the film like that. We wanted to portray it exactly the way it is. Some guys, you know, hitting and, and, and wanting to go in there and eventually unload. I want it to be drama. I want it to be- Right. Like, no, it, it was real. It's not like a preachy kind of- Thing. It's, it's sort of like I, I compared it to like when Rudy goes and speaks to uh, the priest at the school when he can't, you know, when right. he can't get on the team. You know, we really wanted it that way. And I think we got that. Yeah. And on that campus at that school, that's who you would go to speak to. Yeah, sure. In this town, in this small little community, which is a got a heavily Christian population, and he actually had a history with the pastor being right. the father of his old girlfriend. It's an organic <clears throat> move to speak to him, you know, especially because he's already reached out to him, right, and been rejected. So I think I think we wanted it to just come naturally out of the story without having to lace. I cannot watch those movies where it they just seem so unreal to me. Anyone who I know who has shared a story about um, being witness to. I mean, it's just, they don't seem real to me. And that's what, if it's not real, then the audience isn't going to get swept up into the film and be moved by it. It'll be more, they'll be more distant. They'll be watching like, oh yeah, you know, that's nice. Instead of having a, an experience. And I think we really wanted people to have an experience watching the movie. I, I know I did. I mean, <laughs> I mean you're, you're saying that and I was just clicked in my head. I was thinking of when, when he's, drinking and, and i mean again i don't want to give stuff away for people that have seen it but how you just made that scene real of him being up all night and stuff and the, the daughter and the pastor like finding him and how that i wouldn't be i wouldn't be labeling it as anything and i know i haven't been involved in hollywood as much as both of you have and i know how sometimes people can get weird about that stuff but i'm just honestly about having a real conversation like perseverance you were saying and authentic, like authenticity, I think are like keywords in all of our lives and something that that movie really, and hope like shined a light on what more time right now, do we need those things? It's like perseverance for, for both of you. And, and Hallie, if you have a second before we need to go, do you mind if, um, can you share, like speaking of perseverance, you mentioned like from your upbringing, some getting some of those no's and what you kind of had to go through to get into being an actor more and more, like some of the bigger struggles, I guess, to people that are out there getting told some no's in their younger years? Yeah, you know, I have a weird kind of story. And that is that I was raised in the industry. My, my mother, Ann Gilbert, was a 
pretty successful character actress. And my father uh, was a, a prominent writer producer in, in wow. Los Angeles. Not, not like crazy, like Aaron Spelling level kind of, you know, on that level, just normal kind of people working in the industry. But I was raised around it. So I used to go with my, so I had, I had an awareness and an exposure that worked to my advantage. And I got working early on without having to bust through a lot of doors because I had connections that were just part of my extensions of my family's life, right? Right. But, um, I definitely had to like my father, he was producing something that he thought I would be right for. And um, one time I came in and I got the part and another time I came in and oh, this is nice. The scene was a girl, very drunk and like falling down drunk, sloppy drunk having to beg this guy that she had this crush on to have sex with her. And he's like in the middle of rejecting her and then she vomits on him. Okay. So that was the audition scene. Wow. I had to do that in, <laughs> in front of my dad and all the other people. And then I didn't get the part. So he was not like, Oh, here's my daughter. Give her the part. That was like, yeah, thanks dad for putting me through that humiliation. But anyway, so. But do you respect just sorry, like, now, as you're older, you understand like the principle that I always think of that as a parent too. Like with my company, I'm like, if I'm not letting my kids take it over, they're going to come work in their butt off from the ground up and, and yeah. prove and, and yeah. earn their way. And in the moment, it might be like, dad, why didn't you just give me that role? It's you. You could have made that decision. But he's like, no, I want you to earn it, you know? Yeah. Did that click later on or were you like, come on, dad? <laughs> oh, for me, my mom used to do, um, for a while, she was doing a lot of commercials. I used to go on the auditions with her. I used to go to the unemployment office with her. So mm. I knew the life of a, of a working actor growing up. I mean, it was not, it wasn't a shock to my system getting rejected and not getting jobs, you know, and, and having to just kind of, you know, hoof it until you get those doors open for you. And, and, and interestingly, in my career, I got a lot of doors open to me early on and then had to uh, go through that period where things weren't happening. So it was, it was interesting, I, but I have that memory of her struggling, you know, and you just, have to, you just have to show up and do it. Keep a thick skin. Exactly, just show up and do it is pretty much a great mentality that everyone needs to understand and listen. And can, you can complain all you want, and there's stuff that happens that sucks and we are victims of things. But that's what I always say is if complaining worked, like go for it, but it doesn't. You, the world really doesn't care. You still have the key is show up and just keep going one it day, one, one step at a time. Right. One step at a time, one day at a time. To everyone listening, I'm working very, very hard to get this. So when everyone's going to be listening, it should be December 8th and the Tomorrow. movie will be officially the last champion to purchase. So we're, and I'll put the, I have the iTunes link. Everyone listening, it's, it's going to be, be in the show notes. Go ahead. It's going to be on iTunes, Amazon, okay. and Google Play. Initially started and then we'll move into the other platforms. Isn't that, I'm sure you get more used to that, but isn't that so, that still has to be kind of surreal how it's like, not, you probably had a whole plan for the theater launch and stuff. And I think it's, it, it's where it's supposed to be That's right now. Cool. It worked out exactly where it's supposed to be. And I think it's a, a good film that people will, will be able to watch for the, with the whole family over the holidays and um, hopefully can gauge people in conversations other than, you know, the political stuff. You can buy the movie for cheaper than two movie tickets and you can own it so yeah. I, in some ways it's it's kind of cool yeah, yeah i'll i'll personally be purchasing it and oh, hey everyone listen they're not i'm not an investor in this like i'm saying it <laughs> I, it was good i wouldn't recommend stuff to the listeners it's not so it was a damn good movie oh thank you thank mark you so much thank you very much yes thank thank both of you it's it's been an honor and anything else, anywhere else for people to reach you or main thing is check the movie out right now, huh? Yeah, check the movie out. Um, well, on all the platforms today, you can buy it for $19.99 or really tomorrow, tomorrow, sorry, tomorrow. December 8th. December 8th. December 8th. It should be airing. Tomorrow. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, 
but you're gonna be able to rent it also for uh, six ninety nine. So we, we're making it oh, cool. available to everybody, you know, at that price. So that was a, a choice that, as our company, we made. I mean, we could have probably gotten more, but six ninety nine can get everybody to see it. Man, I'm I'm so from my books. Does it show you like on the? So do you get a thing with it directly on there? Does it show you how many? people purchase the movie like on a, are you able to track that on like a daily rate or anything? We're setting that up right now with our uh, aggregator. So we're, we're going to be able to see it. I think one of the, uh, our consultants that we're working with right now, he's, he's able to look at it now, but we're getting all that. Yeah, it's all technical, getting all that stuff. Right. So we can start following. I'm just curious. Yeah. Messaging. We can do that too, to make sure that we're putting the right pieces out there to get people to click on it and all that. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, on social media, anywhere, I'll have the link. Um, Glenn, are you on social media? I know you, I'll have the link though for, for everyone else that is. I'm on Instagram at Hallie Todd. Yeah, um, I found and, um, I And the movie is The Last Champion Film on Instagram. And on Facebook, Last Champion on Facebook. Well, listen, everyone, this, it couldn't be a better time. You, you kind of mentioned it. The person upstairs, whatever you believe in, is orchestrating. And the fact that the movie, The Last Champion, is coming out right now on December 8th to really end what has been still one of the most challenging in so many different ways, years to people out there. They don't like they're losing hope. And I couldn't think of something better that you can be just sitting with your family by yourself and finishing the year out with, with some hope and just knowing to keep going. And I don't want to give anything away, but everyone, God is orchestrating, never settle, never give up and keep elevating beyond. Want to rise above what holds you back? These are the stories of those fighting that battle. It might also be the story of you. I'm Dan Waldschmidt, author of Edgy Conversations and strategist of billion dollar companies all over the world. This is Mark Menard, author of The Story of You, the guy who knows a thing or two about never giving up. You're listening to Elevating Beyond. Let's get started.